Welcome, everybody! New York, on Saturday, July 16th, WWE returns to the world's most famous arena with WWE Live. Experience the hype with all your favorite superstars, including John Cena Live. You want some? Come get some! It's the WWE Live SummerSlam Heatwave Tour in New York, Saturday, July 16th. Tickets and VIP packages are available. This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Welcome back. We are now joined by a good friend of everyone here in the Millennium Wrestling Federation, the Vice President of the Cauliflower Alley Club himself, Mr. Kyle Lauer from Rolla, Missouri. Kyle, thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Looking forward to it. Kyle, Cauliflower Alley Club, to me, it is one of the true gems in professional wrestling. I personally have a great dislike of how wrestlers' lives are during and after their careers when there's very little that can be done for them, when they have health issues, when they have monetary issues. And as far as I know, the Cauliflower Alley Club is really the only organization in existence that does anything to help these human beings. Well, that's basically what our club has really become, uh, Dan, over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Uh, as you know, the humble beginning was 40 years ago uh, by Iron Mike Mazurki, wrestler movie star uh, in Hollywood, California. And at that time, it was really a club to give the boys uh, a place to come when they were booked at Los Angeles. And it's kind of kind of unique then. It started at a, at a little restaurant that Mike started that was called the Baron's Castle, named after Baron Michelle Leone. And, uh, and there was 10 people that started it, and all the wrestlers coming into the L.A. area were invited to come and have lunch on Wednesday uh, and just hang out there until time to go and, uh, and work the Olympic Auditorium that night. So initially, the Cauliflower Alley Club was basically a get-together of people in the business that could go together in private and have a nice lunch together before they had the matches. Absolutely, and in fact, back then, you know, kayfabe was very much alive, and the wrestling business was a very close, uh, private, close fraternity. Uh, and the club at that time uh, was not open to the public. I mean, you had to have been a professional wrestler, boxer, movie, or stunt person to even attend uh, these private luncheons every Wednesday at the, at the Baron's Castle. Well, from those private lunches of 10 people, Kyle, the Cauliflower Alley Club now has had over 5,000 members since its inception 40 years ago. That's right, worldwide. And out of that 5,000, 20-some-odd hundred have, have passed on. Uh, the reason we maintain the 5,000 number, we never retire a, a person's number. Once a person becomes a member, uh, that number stays with that person's name as long as there will be a CAC. Absolutely. Now, in addition to that, in the 40-year history of the Cauliflower Alley Club, there have only been four different presidents, Kyle. Could you talk about who the four different presidents were and what their different visions were for the club itself? Okay, well, Iron Mike Mazurki, he started the club originally just as, as like we say, a get-together for lunch. And then after it began to grow, uh, his ideas became more benevolent. Uh, I joined the club in 1979, uh, and almost within a matter of, uh, within the first year, Mike had kind of drafted me into upper management because of my business background. <clears throat> and he would call me up and say, meet me for lunch. And he'd hand me three or four envelopes with a fair amount of cash in each one. Some he'd say, I want you to take it over and give this to so-and-so. Uh, I know he can't pay his rent. And that would be one of the, the old-time wrestlers. Uh, or go and pay this phone bill, pay this rent, or whatever. And Mike would do that out of his own. He was a very, very generous, benevolent man. When Mike passed away, uh, we were really hurting for a president of, of the same name caliber. Because Mike was, you know, world known. He made over 150 movies and, uh, with John Wayne, the biggest stars. And so we weren't really sure what to do. Well, Archie Moore volunteered. And Archie had about the same background in boxing as Mike had in wrestling. He was considered, you know, he loved kids. He had his boys' homes and his uh, kids' ranches and stuff. 
And so Archie was president for only two years. And then Archie said he just couldn't handle it anymore. It was just, just more than it's more time consuming than he had thought. And that's when we contacted Lou Fez. Now Lou became president uh, for nine years and Lou loved it. Uh, and Lou's whole journey of the Colorado Club was benevolency. Uh, he uh, was instrumental in starting our scholarship fund, which to date we've given out some twenty some thousand dollars in scholarship funds wow. for young athletes. He started the Benevolent Fund, uh, which was designed to help the old timers with things like medical bills, uh, funeral expenses, uh, uh, sometimes just plain pay a bill. Uh, and that there we've given out well over thirty thousand dollars. And then when Lou began to get a little bit older and his health was kind of failing him, uh, he said he'd like to retire. And we ran uh, an office for president, and we had several volunteers, and we had several nominees. Uh, and Red Bastine was, was our current president, was elected president about five years ago. And Red's uh, thing is also benevolency as well as the scholarships. Uh, but he also wants to take the club more international. And that's kind of where we're at right now. We have uh, members coming from uh, England, Japan, Germany, France. This coming year in April, we have uh, 22 coming in from Nigeria. Wow. 22 professional wrestlers, all their champions coming in from Nigeria. Uh, last year, as you know, Anoki was there. Uh, they come from... Uh, Brazil, from Brussels, uh, from England, from France, from Germany, from many, many from Canada. We have a great group of guys from Canada. Now, how would someone from... What, these... what, what, we're, what we're at right now, the main purpose of the club is benevolency. That's the, to take care of the old-timers. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you this, Kyle. How would someone from Brussels find out about the Cauliflower Alley Club? Would it be through the wrestling fraternity, or would it be through the online Cauliflower Alley Club website? Well, we, we do have a, a website, uh, cauliflowerallyclub.org. Uh, the org signifies that we are uh, rated and listed and licensed uh, through by the United States government as a nonprofit organization. There is nobody in our organization other than one person that is paid, and that one person is Maria Bernardi, who is our oldest living member. Her membership is number three. Uh, she's in her early 80s. She's in a rest home now. And the club, uh, for many, many years, for 35, 38 years, she was the secretary of the club. And uh, now her health just doesn't permit that. Uh, and so we pay her a token fee of $200 a month to help supplemental very, very small <laughs> Social Security. And that's the only person that's paid in the club. Red, myself, nobody else, none of the directors. We all pay our own expenses. We buy a ticket for the banquet like anybody else. Uh, and the quickest way to find out about the club is you can go to almost any wrestling website. You can go to OneWrestling.com, Kayfabe Memories, uh, the, uh, uh, the Slam Wrestling from Canada, any website. I would say 85% of them have linked themselves to the CAC. I know we have it linked off of both of our websites, the History of Boston Wrestling website and as well as the Millennium Wrestling Federation site. And one thing we'd really like to do in the year 2005 is basically help spread the word of the Cauliflower Alley Club. As we said at the beginning of this interview, there is nobody else out there doing what the Cauliflower Alley Club is doing. It is something that is desperately needed in the world of professional wrestling. And if the Cauliflower is going to be the only one doing it, we want to see it go to the moon. Well, we appreciate that very much, Dan. Uh, our membership, like I say, we did open it up to uh, the general public or fans or people that appreciate it, appreciate the wrestlers. Uh, uh, our website has all the forms on it. You can print out. You can. We have. Uh, you can do email. You can uh, do uh, telephone calls. You can do good old mail. I'd say ninety percent of our applications still come in by mail. How long has the Cauliflower Alley Club been accepting membership from people outside of the wrestling industry? Well, uh, we're very easy on that now, as we have to be. Uh, once we accepted the nonprofit charter, mm -hmm. uh, it, you cannot deny membership to anybody <coughs> for uh, other than uh, oh, I don't even know what reason we would we, we would legally be able to deny membership. 
uh, other than the fact that maybe convicted of a felony or uh, just just a person that uh, would be, you know, undesirable. But uh, not too many undesirable people are willing to pay twenty five dollars membership, even though that's all the dues are. It's been twenty five dollars for the last fifteen eighteen years. It started out at ten dollars, then went to fifteen, and then went to twenty five, and I believe around nineteen. 87. It's been that ever since then. Now, if someone decides to join the Cauliflower Alley Club, like you said, it's only a $25 membership annually, or you can join as a lifetime member for only $300. I believe part of that is tax deductible. And if you join a lifetime membership, uh, the $300, $275 is tax deductible in that calendar year. It's really a good deal. And you, you get a membership card, obviously. You have a an 8x10 form you could frame and put on a wall. And you also get a, pretty much a monthly newsletter. Yeah, our happening. newsletters, uh, we try to get them out monthly. They don't always, aren't always able to. We don't promise them monthly, but uh, we try to get them out monthly if we can, and sometimes uh, we're not able to do that because, again, it's all done by donations. Right. Dean and Ruth Silverstone donate their time to put together the newsletter. Uh, Royal Duncan at the Royal Press in, uh, in Illinois, uh, he prints the newsletters at the cost of the paper, Then they're sent back to Seattle and mailed on a bulk mailing, and all that besides being time-consuming, uh, it comes out to, with facts and figures and dollars and cents, right at a buck, a buck and a quarter with postage per, per newsletter. So you can see where a person pays $25 and $18 is in cost. It doesn't leave a lot to take care of phone calls, uh, flowers for funerals, and so forth. So sometime if we're a little bit short, uh, we may skip a newsletter one month in order to have the thousand or twelve hundred dollars for something more more needed. Sure, I imagine most members would rather see the money go to a, a good cause like that as opposed to having to wait a little longer to get their newsletter. Yeah, and it's amazing how uh, the newsletters have become collectible items. Uh, some of the ones that have been put out by Art Abrams years ago, which have maybe 50, 60 uh, very vintage pictures in them, that people just love to take these old pictures and uh, put them on their computer and blow them up and make eight by tens and uh, Dean has gotten recently to have the last few newsletters. I don't know if you've received yours or not. I'm sure you probably have. Uh, that big picture of Nick Bockwinkle when he was 15 years old, standing with Brock on the Gursky and all them. Uh, some very, very uh, good, good collectible pictures. Right. There are some great oh. photographs in the newsletter each and every month. Thank you, pardon? There are some great photographs in each issue. Yeah, and some good inside stories. Uh, there, there's articles in there by guys. Uh, the wrestlers write some good articles. And, uh, some of the historians have some good articles. A lot of very interesting historical stuff is in them newsletters. Now, a question that comes to mind, in my mind at least, how many workers currently that you might see in WWF or NWA, TNA, how many of the current performers are part of the Cauliflower and understand exactly what it's all about? Well, sadly enough, I would say uh, less than 10% of the current workers uh, take an interest in the Cauliflower Alley Club. Uh, and I don't know exactly why that is, other than I know the boys in the WWE have such, such hectic schedules that these guys are on the road four or five days a week, and right. uh, there's a lot of demands made upon them. Uh, quite a few of them are, are members of the club, but they don't take the same interest in it because I don't think the fraternity value uh, is is there as we had years ago. Right, it's not as much of a secret society as it was in the past. Well, no, wrestling itself, I mean, <laughs> everybody understands that wrestling is a work now, it is a, it is a business. Uh, and I think even many, many years ago, uh, I remember as a kid, my dad would say, oh, wrestling can't be real. And as a little boy, I would say, well, Dad, of course it's real. And, uh, you know, and he said, well, it could be. That looks pretty rough there. But, you know, no, nobody would say for sure but no, nobody believed it 100% for sure either. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. It was, it was something, and, and, and I got to be around the wrestling business as an 8-year-old kid. Um, many, many of the wrestlers of that day worked at our family business, uh, which was a refrigeration manufacturing business, and that was a great job for the wrestlers during the day to install refrigerators right. and pick up $10, $12, $15 for the day. And I told that the guy, said, $10, $15. And you got to remember, back in the 40s, 60 and 75 cents an hour was good pay. Wow. And the people, don't, people today can't hardly believe that, but 
In my first job, which I started in 1951, I made 85 cents an hour. You were rolling in it, Carl. Huh? You were rolling in it. I was in bad. I actually made more money at some time at the arenas. I was selling peanuts at the uh, Pasadena Arena, Hollywood Lean Stadium, the Olympic Auditorium when I was 8, 9, and 10 years old. And uh, I got a penny and a half a bag. And we sold them for 10 cents a bag or three for a quarter. And I got sometime as much as 6 and $7 at the end of the night. And that was sometimes the boys were getting 10 and $15 payoffs. There you go. They almost wanted to be in your shoes. It was an easy night's work in some cases. And, and like, like Gene LaBelle said, he never took a bump for it either. <laughs> well, Kyle, I'd like to see the Cauliflower Alley Club grow by leaps and bounds. I'd like to see more and more people become aware of it, become involved in it, because I think the more and more people involved in it, the better things the Cauliflower Alley can do itself, and the more people it will be able to help out. I know we had a meeting recently about some of our events coming up in 2005, and one thing we decided on was photocopying membership forms and giving them out to all the wrestlers and a membership form to each fan when they come in. I know at our last event, we held a raffle to help the Benevolent Fund, which we're going to mail out this week to you in a money order. Just things like that to basically let people become aware of what's going on. And not only do you get the newsletter and everything we mentioned, but there's a, an annual banquet that we haven't even talked about yet. Well, the annual banquet, uh, I tell people, you come to one, you won't, you won't miss any more. Uh, uh, last year we had 612 there, uh, 200, and I, if I remember right, 52 or 56 of the boys. Really? And 256 wrestlers in one room at the same time, very many places. Uh, and it's on an altogether different basis. It's a very relaxed atmosphere. Uh, they're just a lot of fun. You see the, see the wrestlers in, a, in an entirely different light. Uh, meet their families and so forth, and it, it is a lot of fun. This year we're at the top of the Riviera overlooking the whole Las Vegas Strip, and the only downside of that, the, uh, the cutoff is 520 people. That's the capacity for, for the Riviera Hotel. So if someone wants to go, it would be pretty much wise to act now. Beg your pardon? I said if someone wants to go, it would pretty much be wise to act now. Absolutely, as, as soon as possible, and it's real easy to do. Just go on our website, then you can print the form out, and uh, you do have to be a member to attend. That's, that's one rule that we did change in the last year. I think that's only fair. Yeah, the, uh, now you can be a guest of a member. I mean, a man and wife don't naturally have to join, or if you have a dad that's in the business or, or a member. Uh, members can always bring family members or, <clears throat> or one guest uh, without them being members. But we had to break it off that way because... Uh, sometime we would get so many, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but collectors mm. would come. And uh, like I had one guy walk up to me last year, and he had some old pictures of me with the mask as the boss man, and he just threw them and threw it down the table. He said, here, sign these. Uh, and that was his term, here, sign these. And I said, I beg your pardon. And he said, sign them. And <laughs> I said... Uh, you weren't even asked. And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, he said I know you're... Your autograph is fairly valuable on eBay because you never signed autographs. And I just told the guy, I said, well, why should I change now with your attitude? And I refused to sign them. And he called me some pretty hefty names. Really? And this was someone that actually attended the banquet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he came. He wasn't a member or nothing. He was, he was a collector. He heard about all the guys being there. And he went out and got pictures, and he made 25, 30 pictures of He had a John Tolles a stack of about 50. Wow. But John Tolles just just threw him up in the air and told the guy where to go. I mean, <laughs> obnoxious character this guy was. Oh, that's ridiculous. I think that, like you said, it's wise to at least have people that are members be the ones that have access to the banquet or family members of those that thereof. Now, the banquet this week year, it's running from April 14th on a Thursday through Saturday night the 16th. What, what are going to be yeah. some of the activities? Well, we have so much going on now. It used to just be Saturday night. You know, we're just the people got there about 6 o'clock at home 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Now we start Thursday morning at 9 o'clock uh, with a wrestling seminar uh, with Harley Race, uh, Les Thatcher, and any of the uh, and Scott Casey are the three main trainers, plus uh, any of the other boys that are attending usually pop in there and help out a little bit and give some pointers. Mm -hmm. And it uh, goes from 9 o'clock in the morning until about 6 or 7 at night, all day Thursday and all day Friday. Now, this is the same seminar that if you go to these seminars that's handled by Harley and Les, you pay several hundred bucks, and it's free. There's no charge to it if you're a member of the club, and, uh, and you are over 18 years old and have at least had one year experience in the wrestling business. We don't take novice naturally or 
kids off the street, but people that just want to kind of tune up their, their careers and, and get some really inside information, that, that there's something that has really caught on well. Last year, and I'm just pulling the figures off the top of my head, but remember, we had like 126 young wrestlers from independent federations come out for this, and every one of them said, boy, they can't hardly wait for next year. Yeah, absolutely. It's a tremendous experience for any younger wrestler just breaking into the business, like you said, that has a year or more experience to be able to learn from these legends. And they're like, you know, a lot of these camps around the country now, they cost a hundred to a couple hundred dollars. And you, right. you and go, if you're a member, it's free. About this right here, it's hands-on training. It's in a private area where uh, you really get a chance. Of other members can come in and watch it, but you get this hands-on training and instructions and teaching, uh, which is, is really quite a nice thing to do. And it's also really helped the club as far as, when you asked me earlier about the younger wrestlers being members, the indie wrestlers are very strong in our club. Mm -hmm. uh, the major stars, like you know, say WWE and TNA and them guys, uh, they're not too strong with us because they're active, they're working, they're making money. They, they, they're, they're not in any need now. Let's put it that way. Right. As they get a little older, they might look back and say, "We didn't have health benefits. We didn't have a pension. We didn't have a union." And they might come to appreciate what the Cauliflower Alley Club does a little bit more and maybe wish they were able to contribute a little bit to it when they were in their prime years making the big bucks. Well, your guys in the business today that are second and third generation, they're very active in the club because they knew what their dads went through. Exactly. Uh, another thing we started up is a nostalgia fair, which has become very popular. All the wrestlers that have books and stuff that they wrote that they want to want to get rid of and sell and uh, several of our of our members are historians and, and major collectors, and we put up a fantastic display of nostalgia. I mean, you can spend two or three hours just walking around all the uh, wall boards that we put up, pictures that, you know, you couldn't find anywhere, uh, as well as then the, the guys will bring their books and they'll be selling their books, like last year Bobby Heenan previewed his book, and Jack Briscoe previewed his book, and all the other guys that have books bring their books out there, and, and it's a chance to sit down and visit with the guys and pick up a book and get it personally signed and all that. And, mm -hmm. uh, and most of the guys don't charge for autographs like many of these other shows. Right. It's just it's an overall positive situation, a positive environment for those that just appreciate professional wrestling from every generation. And then another thing we started uh, four years ago uh, is called the Baloney Blowout. And that's on Friday night now. That's a flat $10. That's all you can eat uh, very glorified bologna blowout, as only Vegas can do, with uh, three, four, five, six kinds of meats and cheeses and all the stuff that goes with it, and a uh, huge table are set up, and you go back and forth all you want. And that's when we have an open mic situation where some of the guys get up there and tell stories and road stories and so forth, and uh, everybody that's registered is introduced, so you know who's there in case you weren't sure so-and-so was going to be there. And that goes Friday night from roughly... Uh, seven o'clock until well I think last year the last guy left about four thirty in the morning. Oh wow. So as long as someone's there, I mean and the hospitality area is open the entire three days, not closed. Really? So there's someone there all the time and uh, we have uh, hundreds of hours of old films, old wrestling films that are running constantly on a TV. Uh, Mark Nolte has donated a lot of great films to us and Jim Melby and uh, Ovo Martinez, a lot of guys, they've sent us copies. and So we run these vintage film matches going on. Some going into the 40s, early matches at the Hollywood League in the 50s, stuff from uh, the Amphitheater in Chicago and uh, Marigold Garland Gardens. and uh, All this vintage matches are going. and It's amazing to see some of the guys standing there watching their own matches uh, 50 years ago. Absolutely. It sounds fantastic. And then we've talked about Thursday. There's a wrestling seminar, Friday wrestling seminar. You have the baloney blowout, the nostalgia fair. Then Saturday, you come to the main event, Kyle. Let us know what's going to take place on Saturday night, April 16th. Well, that's there when we have our, our, our big uh, sit-down uh, banquet, a uh, uh, three or four-course fine meal, uh, Vegas-style served. And then we do what we call our award ceremony. And that's where we have, uh, we induct people into what we call uh, the College Rally Club Wall and Walk of Fame. And uh, uh, there's been about 330 over the last 40 years. Wow. Uh, 
nine years ago after Mike Mazurki passed away, we, we created what we call our highest award. That's the Iron Mike Mazurki Award. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of qualifications to get that. Not, I'd say maybe one out of every 200 wrestlers would even qualify for it. Wow. And to start with, they have to be immediately recognizable. In other words, when they walk down the street, people got to say, I know him. Mm-hmm. Or they think they know him, but they immediately know he, he or she is somebody. They have to have been successful in two or more careers, not just wrestling or sports. And most important, they have to be a very benevolent person that gives a, gives away a lot more than they take back. Mm-hmm. And them three qualifications make it fairly hard. Yeah, I'd say so, too. And uh, this year's uh, Iron Mike honoree is Terry Funk. Man, successful in the world of professional wrestling all over the world, not just the United States. He's well known in Hollywood from some of his appearances in famous movies. Fantastic movie star and one of the most benevolent guys you'll ever meet. That sounds fantastic. Terry Funk is someone that any fan would enjoy sitting down and speaking to, even for a minute or two. Well, if you've never spent ten minutes with Terry Funk, you haven't lived in the world of wrestling. (laughs) This guy is unbelievable. Him and I have been very, very close friends for better part of the last 15 years. We both have cattle ranches. Uh, we've both uh, been around the wrestling business in almost every facet. And we both have worked the movies and the stunt work. And we just are just, I mean, we're just good friends. And uh, well, Terry's been actually nominated every year since the award had been, been created. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, this is the first year that he has honestly <laughs> retired. Uh, he's had the only, I tease him, he's the only guy I know that's had 350 retirement <laughs> matches. You're not far from the truth. <laughs> and so, so Terry is there. Then we have our Lifetime Achievement Award, which is named after Art Abrams, the man that had my job before he passed away, the executive vice president. Uh, and that there this year is Les Thatcher. No, well known in the wrestling industry. Les, who uh, has has accomplished so much more in life than people realize. They thought, oh, yeah, he was a great wrestler. Well, he's more than a great wrestler. He's an unbelievable trainer and instructor. I would say Vince would probably tell you that over his last 20 years, somewhere between 25 and 40 percent of his top stars were hand-trained by Les Thatcher. Wow. And people don't realize the, the important role Les has played in wrestling in his career as well as with these young fellas today. And then an award that was just created two years ago, uh, named after Lou Thez, the Lou Thez Memorial Award. Uh, Lou actually gave us five names that he would like to see honored if he ever died. And sadly enough, we, we had that talk here in, in Missouri uh, when Lou, uh, uh, two weeks later, entered the hospital uh, for chest pains and went through some surgery and never came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, last year, the award was given to Antonio Anoki. Uh, Lou uh, requested mention to Anoki as one of the guys uh, because he thought he had done a lot for international wrestling. Uh, he also named four other guys, and this year one of them four is Jack Briscoe. Jack Briscoe, known the world over, great NWA World Heavyweight Champion, a great amateur wrestler. He has a book out now as well, I believe. Oh, yeah, Lou, Lou has a great respect for him, and uh, the other one that Lou admired. Uh, in fact, Lou made the comment on any given night, this the one per individual could have beat me any time he wanted to, and there was nobody that could beat this individual if he did not want to get beat. And uh, he's been named as the greatest wrestler that ever lived is Danny Hodge. Danny Hodge, Oklahoma native, I believe. Yeah, a lot, well, Dan, Danny has received every award every organization has to give out. Uh, in the Missouri, uh, you know, in the Newton, uh, uh, International Wrestling Hall of Fame, Canadian Hall of Fame. Uh, he's been honored by us in every category. <coughs> oh, he's been honored more than once by the Cauliflower. Oh, yeah, he's, yeah he's, he's the only guy that has received the Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, the International Award, the uh, Walk of Fame Award. Oh, wow. Humanitarian Award. I mean, he, you name it, he does it. Even to this day, Danny goes out and works with the kids in amateur background and teaches the... Uh, and I'm not sure how old, how old Danny is, but uh, he is no, uh, he's not a teenager anymore. No. He'll get down on that mat and he'll stretch you. Will he be at the banquet this year? Oh, absolutely. Danny, Danny has missed once in the last 15 years. Wow. Only because the World Invitational Danny Hodge Amateur Wrestling Championships were going on the same night in Reno, Nevada. 
Wow. He was in the same state, at least, so he was there in spirit. And uh, another guy that uh, the Iron Mike honorees have been Dick Byers, the destroyer. The very first one was uh, Woody Strode, uh, um, H.P. Haggerty, uh, Vic Christie, Judo Jean LaBelle, uh, Stu Hart three years ago. Uh, you know, so the, the, the award has been given to people that most people would look up to and totally admire that person. Mm -hmm. Well, Carl, we're running out of time with this interview. I could go on all night talking about wrestling like this because I really enjoy it. In one, two or three sentences, sum up why someone should join the Cauliflower Alley Club and why they should get on a plane and head out to Vegas the second week in April. Well, first of all, to join the club, you're putting a little bit back for all the enjoyment you got because the money goes to help those that made this sport what it is today, a household word. If you come to Las Vegas, you'll never, ever miss another one because you'll have a chance to see people you've only heard or read about, and you'll see them on a one-to-one -one basis, sit out and break bread with them, as Ruth Ed would say, and really, really enjoy your week.